Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you to thank you for coming. Thank you for attending today. Uh, welcome to our Affluence Funds Management Update webinar. Today, uh, my name is Daryl Wilson, and I'm the CEO and Portfolio Manager at Affluence. And along with my colleague, Greg Lander, uh, we make the investment decisions on the Affluence Funds. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about both of our funds, the Affluence Investment Fund and the Affluence LIC Fund. I'm gonna focus probably on the areas that people are most interested in. So how we're seeing this very, very tricky investment environment, uh, what's in the portfolios right now, and <clears throat> where we're seeing a bit of value out there at the moment. Um, so if everyone's cool with that, I'm going to make a start. Um, hopefully we'll leave enough time for questions at the end. This should go for approximately 45 minutes through the slide and then uh, I will take questions uh, if you have any. So firstly, just a very brief background on us. I won't spend much time on this because I think pretty much all the attendees will be familiar with us through our regular emails and information they've got from our website. Uh, we have two funds that are available to all investors, our Affluence Investment Fund and our Affluence LIC Fund. And this is a bit of a diagrammatic representation of what you're getting. So our Affluence LIC Fund invests specifically in listed investment companies. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little more later, obviously, but in essence, listed investment companies are just funds that are listed on the stock exchange. And the difference between a normal managed fund and a listed investment company or a LIC is that the LICs trade up and down depending on the whims of the ASX. They don't necessarily trade at their net asset value or at the value of their investments, which managed funds do. And so that introduces both perhaps risk and opportunity in that LIC space. Uh, and so that fund is, as far as we know, the only one in Australia that specifically invests in LICs. It generally holds 20 to 35, plus some cash at any given time. Our Affluence Investment Fund, if you invest into that, you're going to automatically get a share of the Affluence LIC Fund. So if you're putting uh, a dollar into the Affluence Investment Fund, between 10 and 20% of that is going into the LICs. Uh, between 60 and 85% is going into our portfolio of underlying fund managers that we choose. And through those, you're getting access to all sorts of different things, stocks, bonds, property, derivatives, all sorts of different investment strategies. And also in that Affluence Investment Fund, we hold some cash. Generally speaking, with both funds, we're targeting regular income, long-term capital growth. Myself and Greg co-invest in our funds alongside you. And we importantly, uh, and quite uniquely in Australia, charge only a performance fee. We charge no fixed fee for managing any of these funds. And so essentially, if the fund does well and you as investors do well, then we do well. Now our Affluence Investment Fund is really designed to be an all weather fund. And the idea is that it was set up to mimic some of the features that very long-term investors like family offices, US endowment funds and the like do. And so they take a long-term view, they invest differently, they look at where they are in the investment cycle, uh, and they aim to deliver above average returns over the medium to long term. We also added some features specifically for our market and probably the most important of those is monthly distributions. So our Affluence Investment Fund pays monthly distributions targeting a minimum of 5% per annum. The way we do it is we essentially take the money in the fund and we pool it and we give it to a range of underlying fund managers. So sometimes that known, that's known as a fund of fund structure. Uh, and through that, you're getting access to, at the moment, over 30 different fund managers and unlisted funds and all of the expertise and the diversification that goes with that. Those fund managers are chosen by us using a range of criteria. Uh, you can see here the performance of the Affluence Investment Fund. So even though it's not specifically designed to outperform the stock market, it actually has done so since inception over five years ago. Um, and you can see diagrammatically on that graph there that the green line is a lot less volatile. It has a lot less ups and downs than the orange line, which is the ASX. 
And generally speaking, that's the way we'd expect the fund to behave. So when the stock market is going up gradually, we would expect to go up gradually. When the stock market screams ahead quickly, we won't perhaps quite keep up. But when the big dips come, hopefully we're going to do a lot better than the stock market. And so if we can deliver a similar return with less hollows and bumps, then we think that's going to be attractive to the investment market. When we choose the underlying managers for the portfolio, here's a list of some of the factors we look at. In essence, we're looking for managers who have performed well at whatever particular investment strategy they're using. We're looking for teams that have been together for a long time, that have the right strategy that we believe can outperform and that we can understand why they outperform and that they have the right structure wrapped around them. And generally that means that we're investing with what we call boutique managers. They're not the necessarily the bigger, more well-known benchmark hugging names you might've heard of. These are genuinely differentiated managers, genuinely differentiated strategy. And the result of all of that is, is really a lot of diversification within the Affluence Investment Fund portfolio. So this is a quick pie chart of the portfolio as at 31 October. Um, and we had about 11% cash at the end of October. And then you can see the various other components. So this is looking through all of the funds that we're invested in to give you an idea of the underlying assets and investment strategies um, that we're invested in. So you've got some market neutral and what we, call, what we call alternative strategies, a little bit of resources, 11 or 12% property, some global equities, which is actually quite a low allocation at the moment. I'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Uh, around 30% in Australian equities ultimately, and around 17% in the LIC fund, which in turn is obviously very, very diversified by not only individual LIC, but also investment strategy and asset class. Now, while it's always important for us to be diversified, we will tilt the portfolio depending on how we feel about markets. So this is a kind of a stylized investor um, sentiment graph, if you like. So the point of this is to say that when we see some of these things, excitement, euphoria, anxiety, and we're seeing some of these things now, uh, optimism, uh, we are more likely to be more conservatively positioned, uh, more cash, more things that aren't having as much market exposure, and perhaps even some hedging by way of put options. Conversely, when we see the sort of conditions we saw in March, April this year, panic, capitulation, despondency, we're much more likely to be putting some, some of that money to work and investing. And so by doing that, we're ultimately trying to say that when we feel assets are expensive, we're gonna own less of them. And when we feel assets are cheap, we're gonna own more of them. And the simple thing is if we get that more right than wrong over time, we will add value. Having said all of that, I think we've never seen perhaps a more difficult investment environment that we're seeing right now. It's very, very difficult to know exactly where we are. And I've got a couple of slides that will just demonstrate why that is. And you're probably aware of this yourselves. Firstly, uh, this is a graph of unemployed. And a lot of the graphs we put out there are using US data. There's a couple of good reasons for that. One, there's a lot more of it. And two, the US market, whether we like it or not, leads the world. So we do spend a lot of time looking at US data. This is temporary versus permanently laid off. And you can see starting in January this year, you can see the massive bubble of what people thought were temporary layoffs in the eye of the storm with COVID. And you can see a very low number there for the permanently laid off. Fast forward to September this year, the temporary layoffs have gone down quite a lot, but the permanent layoffs are very high and growing. And so what that tells us is we actually don't know. It's getting worse still than we thought it was back here. We don't know really, and this is the case for Australia as well, how bad it is. We don't know what the true permanent unemployment is. We don't know what the true debt defaults. We don't know how many businesses will actually ultimately be shuttered. You know, what's permanent versus what's temporary. Now the markets aren't really thinking about that at the moment. They're thinking about two other things. They're thinking about vaccines and they're thinking about government and central bank stimulus. So this is the other side of the coin. And this is why markets are screaming ahead even though people are looking at it and going, well, this doesn't really match the fundamentals. This is US 10 year interest rates for the last 200 years. I'm sure someone had a good mission putting that together. And what we're seeing here is obviously we are now at a low point. 
and quite a substantial low point over the last 200 years. We've never seen US interest rates as low as they've been in recent times. Now, this is not only the case in the US, it's the case everywhere around the world. We are seeing governments and central banks do whatever it takes. And Australia has convincingly joined that party in the last six months. We've seen our central bank lower interest rates, but also step into the market to buy Australian bonds and do some things they've never done before. And we've seen the mother of all stimulus packages and particularly the latest budget from our uh, generally fiscally conservative government has broken all records in terms of deficits. So that is what's driving markets in the short term. In the medium term, this may have an impact. And so we have one eye to the first few months of next year because I think what's permanent versus temporary will become a lot more apparent. Uh, but for now, markets are ripping ahead and we are, um, I guess, positioned to at least participate in some of that upside. And so this is where we are. I mean, I can equally make a case right now that we're coming out of a recession, that the worst is over and that we should be buying things that are gonna do well as a recovery. Or I can make a case to say, well, we don't actually know the true extent of the damage yet and it's worse than we think. And we're seeing in markets and in behaviors, uh, examples of both. We're seeing plenty of late cycle behavior. We're seeing plenty of extremely overvalued sectors and markets but we're also finding good value in some areas. In fact, exceptional value in some areas, particularly in some of those places where uh, they've lagged the market over the last few years. So we've just never seen such a wide divergence in valuations. We've never seen such a wide divergence in opinion, even amongst a lot of the fund managers out there who we have a massive amount of respect for. Uh, I've got some uber bears and some quite bullish fund managers out there and so it's very, very difficult. I think if you're having a big bet one way or the other at the moment, that is probably fraught with a lot of danger. What are we doing as a result? What we're doing is we are really catering for the potential for either of those two outcomes to happen. So we're overweight cash alternatives, we're overweight small cap value, which is some of the cheapest things we can buy. The LICs are very good, uh, have been very good. Uh, value and continue to be, and we've been overweight those. We are underweight bonds because they pay virtually no yield. We are underweight US stocks, particularly the tech and growthy stocks that are on nosebleed valuations. And we're underweight journey property, but we are having a reasonable size bet on listed shopping center REITs, which at the moment are trading at discounts to net asset value of generally between 25 and 50% depending on the particular read. Um, so that's an example of something where we see extreme value. You could look at the FANG stocks and say that's an example of something that we see extreme overvaluation and we have very little exposure to that. Um, currently, we are invested across a whole range of fund managers and we rate them all very, very highly. Uh, if you have a chance, I won't go through this chart in detail, but this gives you an idea of our particular asset allocation currently versus the ranges. So if you look at cash, for example, we have a range of five to 20% of the portfolio. What we call our neutral, or if we thought everything was fairly valued is about seven and a half, and we're currently sitting at 11 or 12. So you can see we're a little bit above where our neutral setting would be there. And the various other asset classes, you can see there where we're under or over. And that gives you a good example of how we've got the portfolio. Now, just a bit more of a dive into some of the managers. This is our top 10 underlying managers in the Affluence Investment Fund as at the end of October. Combined, they're 46% of the portfolio. And if you include the cash, that's about 58%. Uh, most of the other holdings outside this tend to be between about 1% and 2.5% of our portfolio. Even within this top 10, there is a quite substantial amount of diversification. Uh, so we've obviously got our LIC holdings, which there's 20 different LICs doing 20 different things and through a range of different asset classes. We've got three small cap fund managers in our top 10, but they're all quite different. Phoenix Opportunities Fund looks at small and micro caps with a slight value bias. Wentworth Williamson is a very deep value, contrarian, uh, quite concentrated manager, which has had a very tough period over the last little while, but we're backing that value is going to make a resurgence at some point. 
QVG, on the other hand, is more growthy and are focused on some of the quicker growing companies and have an exceptional track record over a very long time. So even though we've got the three small cap funds there, they're all quite different in terms of their portfolio construction, their outlook and how they're positioned. We've got the Cooper's Investors Brunswick Fund, which is both ASX and global, mostly large cap, has tended to outperform markets by three to 4% per annum, reasonably consistently. And this is one of a number of funds within the Cooper Investors stable. And it's the one where Peter Cooper, the founder, has the majority of his personal wealth. And when we see situations like that, we tend more often than not to back the founder fund. Bronte Capital, uh, run by John Hampton. They have a very, very good strategy at shorting. So they, they are long, they own a bunch of high quality global stocks, and then they short a bunch of rat bags, fraudsters, fakes, companies they feel through uh, their database and through the data they can access are effectively not going to go that well. It's a very specific shorting strategy that's worked very well for them over a long period of time, uh, and they have very, very good investment results. Packer & Co, the Packer Investigator Trust, is a fund run out of Western Australia, uh, has been going for over 20 years, around 25 years, strong double digit returns. Uh, Willie Packer, who is the key portfolio manager there, has shown an uncanny ability to pick market turning points. And having had been positioned in global stocks pretty much for the last few years, up until early this year, sold almost everything in February, March this year, and went to at one point, I think about 70 to 75% cash. Uh, that particular fund is still incredibly conservatively positioned with cash, bonds, some gold, and only around 30 to 35% of stocks right now. Uh, so there's an example of the manager, a manager that's, that's quite negative on the medium term implications for markets. The L1 Property Fund is a specific strategy that looks to buy groups of apartments in the UK at a discount in one line, and then repositions, um, tarts them up, increases income, and sells them at a profit down the track. A very specific strategy that has gone quite well uh, over a long period of time. We have the Australian Leaders Fund in there. Now that is an LIC, and normally LICs are held in our LIC fund. That is a very specific short-term catalyst trade where that particular fund, and we also do hold ALF in our LIC fund, um, that particular uh, LIC is being converted to an unlisted fund and ultimately possibly wound up in the next year or so. So there's a short-term trade for us. And finally, Alliston Gems is another example of uh, within the Alliston stable, there are a range of different funds. The Gems Fund is the one where Ashok Jacob, the founder, has the majority of his personal wealth. And so again, that's us backing a founder fund with a very good track record. So that gives you some sort of example as to our top 10. If you'd like to see a few more, you can log on to our website and you can see uh, a few more of our top 15 or so holdings. Or just uh, give us a bell or send us an email and we'll send you through a larger list. Distributions I mentioned earlier, you'll see here, uh, this is quarterly distributions and you can see we've tended to pay uh, pretty consistently or we've paid around 6.7% per annum since inception. We aim for five, we generally pay at a rate of around 5% through the year. And to the extent you'll see each June here in each June quarter, there's most years, there's an extra bump that wasn't in 2019. So if we've had a good year or we've generated taxable profits, capital gains that we need to distribute, we tend to do that in the month of June. Um, but when we talk to people about distributions, we say you should assume that we're going for our target of 5% and consider anything above that as a bonus. Also, like all managed funds, our performance statistics don't include franking credits, but we do tend to distribute those every year. So anything we receive, we distribute up through the tax statement at the end of the year. And that typically for this fund is between 0.4 and 0.5% per annum. One of the things we focus on in the fund is doing well in market downturns. Uh, and there's a few things we do, but essentially these are some of the things that have the most impact. I've talked already about the fact that we like to own things that are cheaper than average, which in theory, uh, in theory at least, should fall less in a market correction. We specifically target managers who themselves have handled downturns better than average. 
through having a range of different, obviously diversified assets class, but also different investment styles, we can reduce that volatility as well. Because for example, when markets are falling, sometimes market neutral and long short funds can do very, very well. In fact, sometimes they can even deliver positive returns in negative markets. We can also hold unlisted uh, assets through funds. So unlisted property funds or unlisted, unlisted infrastructure funds would be an example of that. Right now we hold very, very little of that because we feel the listed markets are providing better value. We obviously have the ability to flex our cash between five and 20%. And we also can use uh, put options to hedge the portfolio to a degree, although we tend to do that reasonably sparingly. So the idea there is that it's not our primary goal but if we can do things to make sure that the returns we get are smoother, then that's gonna give everyone a better outcome over the long term. And you can see here, this is an example of the downside, what we call the downside uh, limited or the downside deviation or downside capture in our funds. So the gray bars in this graph are the 10 worst months in the ASX since our affluence investment fund started and the green bars are what happened to the fund in that month. So by far the worst in March this year, the ASX 200 fell 20.7%. The affluence investment fund fell 8.7%. So you shouldn't assume that we can't fall uh, because ultimately we do have exposure to markets and we will be impacted by that. But you can see the pattern here generally is that we've done a lot better than the ASX in falling markets. And that's the way we like it. The returns over time, I mentioned already the distribution, 6.7%. The total returns have been around seven to seven and a half over five years. And since inception, over the last one and three years, less impressive, although we're having possibly our best month ever in this fund this month. So that one year number uh, will come up, I think by October. And the other thing to bear in mind is that obviously the ASX the end of October was negative over the last 12 months. So if we can deliver a positive return or if we can outperform the most when markets are falling, that's the way we like it. Uh, the three year numbers a bit lower than we'd like. That really more than anything else is to do with the fact that we have a big value investment bias in our portfolio. Yes, we have some growth managers in there, but by far and away, the larger number of value managers and values had a terrible terrible time for the last three years, the difference in returns between uh, the cheaper and the high growth stocks is probably never been seen before, or it's at least very close to previous episodes. So we are picking that over the next few years, we will see a turnaround in that trade. We will see value start to outperform again. And our fund, this fund should be a beneficiary of that if it happens. The other thing to point out is that, as I mentioned earlier, the fund has also managed to outperform the ASX over the last uh, five years and, and since inception, and obviously the last one year as well. Now, turning to our LIC fund, I'll talk a little bit about that now, and I'll give you really spend some time talking about our top holdings there and, and how we think about those and how we think about LICs in general at the moment. We actually didn't start out when we started Affluence to invest in LICs. We kind of stumbled across the sector when we were doing work on unlisted funds. And we discovered that there's something we really liked about the LIC sector. And the something we really liked, as I mentioned earlier, was the fact that they can actually trade at discounts to their net asset value. So that for us is the greatest source of opportunity. But there's also some other things about LICs we like. The first one is that the, the quality of the managers in the LIC sector, and there are about 100, 110 LICs listed on the ASX. The quality of LIC managers is much higher than unlisted funds. Now that doesn't mean they're all high quality. We would generally screen out between 20 and 30 at any given time as either too small, too illiquid or, or uninvestable for other reasons. But that gives us an opportunity set of maybe 60 to 70 LICs at any given time. Uh, and through that, they're not all equity focused. We have obviously some global equities and Aussie equities, but there's also other investment strategies creeping in. So long, short, absolute return, market neutral, private equity, infrastructure, commodities, um, and obviously more recently, a whole bunch of LITs, which invest in debt, essentially of different types. So that allows us to put together a portfolio that is a lot more diverse than say might've been the case um, 10 years ago when your opportunities were probably severely limited. 
When we look at LICs, we're looking for three things. We're looking for at least one of these. So if we want to put an LIC in the portfolio, we want it to at least be what we call an alpha generator. That's just a fancy term to say we think they can outperform over time. We want to capture a discount, which means it needs to be cheaper than we feel like it should be, cheaper than average, cheaper than uh, conditions would suggest it should be. Or we have event-driven type trades or catalyst trades where there's something specific, specific happening with an LIC. So we go through the field, we rank all of these opportunities, we look at the way to do it, and then we take a top-down view because it may be that there's a whole range of Australian equity licks trading cheap, but we can't have a portfolio full of Australian equity LICs. So we use diversification and other tools to determine the specific weightings um, and where we want individual opportunities to sit within the portfolio. And that gives us 20 to 35 LICs. Now, where we sit in that range depends on how many opportunities are out there. For example, in March, April this year, we were right at the top end of that range. A whole bunch of LICs were cheap. There was just so much opportunity, it wasn't funny. Uh, and so we had a very wide range of licks in the portfolio. Now, a lot of them have come back up. A lot of the discounts have closed up. A few have disappeared for various reasons. And we're actually right down towards the bottom of the range right now at around 20 LICs. Uh, and so that represents the fact that, yes, I think in the LIC sector, a lot of the easy money has been made over the last six or seven months. But as you'll also see, there are still some reasonable opportunities out there as well. Now I'll talk a little bit about the discount capture because that's something for us that is uh, sustainable through the cycle. Essentially what we're doing there is we look at each LIC. Greg, my colleague is our internal specialist. He runs an in-house portfolio model. And what we're trying to do there is we obviously have the history of each LIC, the trading history. We try to monitor what investments they own and we try to kind of mark those to markets. So we get two things out of that. We get an idea of what their current NTA is and some, some LICs disclose it daily, some weekly, some monthly. Uh, and the monthly ones uh, sometimes with a two week lag. So quite often that information can be quite valuable if we're a week or two into a month and we think we know what the NTA is, perhaps better than the market, that can present us with an opportunity. So we try to monitor those NTAs and then obviously we monitor the individual discount to NTA, the trading price compared to the NTA. And we look at a whole bunch of factors as well. Um, but the most important for an individual LIC is, you know, what's the current discount versus say the longer term average. And that more than anything else might inform for us whether we think it's particularly cheap or expensive right now. Of course, it can work the other way. You've got to be careful in this space. Discounts can increase too. Um, and that means it can get worse. Uh, and in fact, some LICs go from discounts to premiums and back to discounts. So um, you've got to be super careful in this space. A lot of people have been burned buying IPOs at NTA and then seeing those discounts expand to 15, 20, 25%. And, and essentially that's a big headwind for that particular LIC. We prefer to do it the other way. If we can buy at a 15, 20, 25% discount, and see that discount close up, it gives us a way to add extra value over and above what's going on out there in the market itself. <clears throat> this is a chart that goes in every monthly report for the LIC fund. It's the discount of our current portfolio compared to the longer term average. So you can see for the first three years of the LIC fund's existence, discounts average between six and eight percent generally. Starting in 2019, they blew out. They then recovered a bit uh, when effectively Labor lost the election and the franking credits issue went away. And then they exploded again into March this year. They probably got to around 25% in our portfolio or maybe even a little higher during the month of March this year. And since then, we have seen them generally and steadily come back in a little bit. The last month at the end of October was 17. Right at today, we're probably somewhere around 15 or 16. So that pattern is continuing this month where those discounts are reverting closer to normal. Some key stats around the LIC portfolio, those 21 LICs. So you can see here, this is the discount around 30% 
is between a 5 and 15% discount, whereas 60% is a discount of 15% or above. Uh, now, bear in mind, this data is at the end of October, and in fact, a lot of things have changed in November. So a lot of these discounts have closed. We had an exceptionally good month in the LIC fund this month. So if I was to rip just these charts again today, uh, they would look slightly different. You can see we've got a range of market caps. Some of the LICs are quite small, less than 50 million, 50 to 100, 100 to 250, and so on. Uh, we tend to, most of the money in the sector is in the billion dollar plus LICs. Afic, Argo, Milton are the big three. We tend not to own those most of the time. Our sweet spot is the small to medium LICs where we're seeing more pricing movement and more opportunity day to day. And so if you currently own Afric, Argo, Milton in your portfolio, perhaps the LIC fund could be an interesting um, balance or, or, or perhaps um, sit alongside that quite comfortably. Geographically, uh, at the moment, if you look through and say, where are the LICs themselves invested? Just over half in Australia and just over a third globally with the rest sitting in cash. These are our top 10 or 12 LICs at the end of October. And you can see here um, quite a divergence. So the interesting thing here is the geographies, a mix of Australian and global, you can see quite a few different strategies in there, some long shorts, quite a few smaller cap focused ones, uh, one market neutral. These are the weightings within the portfolio. So the bigger holdings tend to be in that five to seven and a half percent range. It's quite rare for us to have an individual LIC that makes up more than 10% of our portfolio. Um, by the same token, it's quite rare for us to have one that's less than sort of one to one and a half percent. There isn't much point owning something that small. Um, the discounts at October, and as I said, a lot of these have moved. So these are not recommendations. Do not go out and buy these today. Um, you know, I'll give you just one example of that. Uh, Tribeca Natural Resources was almost a 25% discount back at the end of uh, October. I think now it's into about a nine or 10%. Contrarian Value Fund in the last week or so has announced a potential wind up transaction that discount has gone from 16 or 17 percent into uh well into single digits um, so these move around a lot unlike our affluence investment fund where we tend to invest with a manager and be there for three to five years with our LICs we are a lot more active and that's part of the attractiveness of the space for us is that opportunities can come and go quite quickly and we can get the opportunity to perhaps sometimes trade uh, and make reasonable money in an okay time frame. The rationale for each of these, so you'll see here, there's generally, for something to be a larger LIC in our portfolio, it can't just be one thing. We can't just really like the manager or we can't just think, well, gee, that discount's better than it should be. We're seeing two or three reasons generally to own these LICs. And so I might run through them quickly just to give you a rough idea, thorny opportunities. Alex Waislitz is a billionaire. He manages two LICs. This is the more value focused one. Uh, we do rate his investment prowess. It's currently trading in a 20 plus percent discount. It's one of our top picks for the next 12 months. Uh, we like it a lot. The fees, unfortunately, in this particular LOP is horrible, um, but notwithstanding that, we feel there's a lot of value there. So that's uh, now our biggest holding. Wham Alternatives is the old blue sky, and that's quite a mature holding in our portfolio now. It's about 18 months into a process. Uh, blue sky was the old manager. We picked this up generally at a 30 plus percent discount between one and two years ago. Uh, what's been happening now is that there's been a transition going on, and so the manager has changed, and Wilson Asset Management who are one of the higher quality managers in the sector have been appointed and they're getting on about changing the strategy, remarketing the fund, and um, we'll do some good work, I think, over time. So we've seen as a result of that, the discount come in substantially. And so we've made over 20% on this LIC in the last 12 months, just through the discount reducing. Um, the portfolio itself has done low single digit returns, which has been okay. Um, but you can see the majority of it 
um, has come from uh, the discount catcher. L1, um, quite a different story. The discount has come in a little bit, but by far, particularly in the last two weeks, uh, what's happened there is L1 were very much positioned for better than expected vaccine news and for a recovery trade. And so the NTA of L1's um, uh, lick has gone up substantially so far in November. Uh, we believe there's more to go there, but certainly we do believe L1, despite a hiccup soon after listing, we believe they are a quality manager, the discount's attractive, the recovery trade's attractive. So it's one of our bigger holdings. Monash is delisting and changing to an exchange traded managed fund. So essentially in a few months time, that 11% discount will disappear and you will be able to redeem that particular investment at NTA. So there's really a free upside there if you can go through that process. Obviously there's still a portfolio there, so that will go up and down depending on markets. Platinum is one of our newer holdings. Again, our view is their value style has been out of favor but they haven't forgotten how to invest and they will make good money over the next two, three, four years. And that in the last two months has gone into our top five as a larger holding. Australian Leaders, I've mentioned, is also winding down or converting to an unlisted fund. And so we expect to be out of that in the next two or three months. Tribeca is really a trade on not only the discount, but also their resources focus. Uh, if you believe there's a recovery coming, you would believe that resources are going to do quite well over the next two or three years. And so that's one of the reasons that's in our fund. Contrarian value is another catalyst trade. As I mentioned earlier, they announced a transaction to effectively delist and wind up. Uh, and so again, uh, that discount ultimately uh, going to disappear over the next three or four months. And in fact, most of it has already disappeared. The price has come up in November. Speria, quality manager, value focus, Sandin quality manager, activist style of investing, which um, we believe quite different and can work quite well. Future generation, FGX and FGG are both in our portfolio. FGG is the global focused one. Uh, these are very diversified, uh, reasonable discount at the moment, chock full of quality managers. So it's a fund of funds type structure, but also instead of charging a fee, those underlying fund managers do their work for free and 1% goes to charity. So it's one of three or four um, LICs out there at the moment that has a dual uh, strategy of performing well on the investment side, but also um, uh, uh, having a charitable focus as well. VGI is like L1, a manager that has stumbled post IPO, but has an exceptionally good long-term track record as an unlisted fund manager over a long number of years we believe they will make good money over the medium term and we believe those discounts will narrow quite a lot. In fact, VGI uh, within six months of listing was actually trading at a premium. So uh, we are quite bullish on those two over a, a three to four year time frame. NGE is a play specifically on oil. Uh, it is a very concentrated portfolio. It, about a third of its money is currently in a stock called Karoom Gas, which uh, is effectively leveraged to the oil price. So again, we believe in the medium term, we'll see potentially a recovery in the oil price and NGE ultimately uh, will be a beneficiary of that. So that gives you a bit of a deep dive into the current portfolio. I think we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, about 14 or 15 of the 21 LICs there. Um, as I said, it does change very, very quickly in this market. I don't think we've ever, I think we've done more trading in the LIC fund in this year than we had done in the three and a half to four years before that combined. It's just been that sort of market. But that's the interesting thing about this space is that when volatility happens, when markets get a bit weird and wonderful, uh, we do tend to see um, a lot of opportunity pop up. Again, the LIC fund has done reasonably well in down markets, but it does have an equity focus. So you shouldn't always expect that it's gonna uh, be able to outperform the equities market, um, particularly if discounts get bigger again across the board. Um, but it is something we, we do again work on to try and make sure. So again, we saw this fund fall in March, but a lot less than the market. 
And again, we try to give regular distributions. This is quarterly, not monthly in this fund. We still target that 5% per annum. We've actually done substantially better than that. We've done just over 7% per annum since inception. Again, we follow that same pattern with regular quarterly distributions around that 5% level and a larger amount in June if we've had a good year. And here's the performance history since the start of this fund, which has been going about four and a half years. So total returns around 10% per annum, uh, which is around three and a bit percent better than the market. We are particularly proud about the last 12 months. Obviously that 13 or 14% performance um, in a market in which the ASX has fallen eight is an exceptional performance. And Again, I should stress that um, that's when we try to do our best work is when markets are in trouble. We try to, to make that gap as big as we can. That's the, what we're set up to do. Conversely, if markets go up massively, uh, we will really struggle to keep up. So we're not going to be doing the, the, the big work in a strongly rising market. We're probably going to be doing our best work, uh, helping to be less bad in a down market. So that's really it for the formal part of the presentation. Um, very happy to take any questions if we have, otherwise you're also more than welcome to uh, contact us at any time. You can email us, uh, you can send through your details and we can um, have a chat over the phone, um, whatever works for you. Um, I had one question specifically before the presentation and we get this a lot. Someone asked me um, which particular uh, fund is, is best. Uh, where would I put my money between our two funds? Um, I can't give personal advice, so I can't answer the question. All I can say is that what I think about um, if you're looking at our two funds side by side and wondering which one's for you, the LIC fund is very much an equities focused fund and I think um, that that's going to be its focus. So if you're comfortable with equity market risk, we should be able to deliver a higher return over time in the LIC fund, but it might be more volatile. So if you're looking at it, perhaps an alternative to uh, an ASX focused fund, then I think the LIC fund might be the one to look at. If you're looking for more longer term consistent return, so something that might sit um, somewhere between, say, a debt fund and an equity fund on the risk reward curve, then the outperformance investment fund is probably more likely to be the one for you. Um, and bear in mind that obviously, if you do put money into the outperformance investment fund, you're automatically getting that LIC exposure as well. And so between 10 and 20% of the money you put into the outperformance investment fund will be going into LICs. Um, got a question here from Ian. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, LIC is winding up. Is that a short-term opportunity? It absolutely is a short-term opportunity. And it's something that, I mean, you, you know, we look for three things, as I mentioned, the alpha generators, the discount capture and the event-driven stuff. Um, it's a short-term opportunity. It's a longer-term headwind in that the more LICs that wind up and delist, uh, the less there's going to be to choose from. <clears throat> excuse me, in the future. Uh, and it may be, in fact, that the LIC market uh, in three or four years' time is down from 100 to maybe less than 50. Uh, we've seen that before. So I certainly think it's a short-term opportunity right now. At any given time, we've got between maybe three and five of our holdings are wind-ups, mergers, delistings, uh, or takeovers. And so that is, that is definitely a chance to make some, some short-term money. Um, Steve, uh, Steve uh, if discounts continue to contract, do you see the IPO market returning again with any significance in 2021? So is, is there going to be more new LICs? Is there going to be more IPOs? I think it's going to take longer than that. Uh, I think you know a lot of people have been burned a lot of advisors have told me they'll never use LICs again. And so that sort of emotional response tends to take four, five, six years to perhaps turn around. Um, so I, there will be IPOs. Um, there's one at the moment where a group called Lanyon, who we rate very highly, are looking to recapitalize an LIC that's winding up. And if that's successful, that will be 
certainly good news. It's a strategy we think will work well, uh, but I think IPOs will be the exception rather than the rule perhaps for the next couple of years. And also I think what you're seeing happening, um, and this is important, is there's a lot more work going in from the ASX on these exchange traded managed fund structures. So it's getting easier and easier for fund managers to effectively put together a fund structure where you can buy and sell a fund uh, through the ASX just like you would a stock. And so that solves the big problem that unlisted funds have, which is people have got to fill out a whole bunch of damn paperwork to invest and to redeem. It solves that problem and it takes away the great weakness of LICs in, in the market's mind at the moment, which is the discounts and premium. Um, and so it means you can buy <clears throat> listed funds effectively on the ASX and you can do so at NTA. And it's you know a few clicks in the same way you'd be buying a share. So I think the IPO market is going to be uh, in trouble for uh, I think a few years potentially. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom's asked about shopping centre REITs, um, and uh, certainly we've got a few in the portfolio. And whether we're starting to see any value in the office REITs, um, look. Uh, and Tom would know this, Greg's and my background is in property um, before Athlons and specifically, in fact, uh, mostly in office. Um, and I would have to say right now, um, we see a much, much bigger opportunity in the shopping centre REITs more than anything else because of the pricing divergence. So they are just so much cheaper than industrial, than a lot of the specialised REITs and, and even a lot of the office REITs are back trading perhaps near or even above their net asset value. Um, so in the short term, we see shopping centres, particularly destination centres, as getting back to normal a lot quicker than people think. I think CBD shopping centres are going to be challenged until we see office markets fully back, and that's going to take a while. Um, so if you go to even here in Brisbane, if you go to the CBD shopping centres, it's pretty quiet. And that's because a lot of the bigger companies have not yet had their staff come back to work in this city. Um, look, office buildings, I do worry a little bit. I mean, I'm not one of those people who believes in major structural change and the death of offices and all that sort of thing. I think over time, there'll be perhaps a change where we see a little bit of back to the future in offices where we see, um, you know, uh, less of this open air type stuff. And so there'll probably be less people leasing offices in the next two or three years, but where they are, they'll be needing perhaps more space per, uh, per person, more uh, square meters per person. So we're kind of pretty neutral on offices. We're not that excited by it. Um, shopping centres for us is the way to go. And we're playing that through small stakes in a number of shopping centres. In Centre Group, which owns all the Westfields in Australia and New Zealand. In Unibail Redamco, which owns all the Westfields globally outside of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and has just been the subject of, of a coup by the ex-CEO and some, and some friends of his. Um, and through Vicinity and one or two other smaller reefs here in Australia. And we've been buying those at 20, 30, 40% discounts. We've seen a lot of that uh, recover this month. They've been a big beneficiary of the vaccine news, um, but we think that will continue to gradually get better. Um, anonymous attendee has asked, what is our view of the recent rotation from growth to value stocks? Uh, we welcome it. We think the imbalances were huge. I, I hope that it's the start of some sort of mean reversion and that is what we are positioned for. But we've had a couple of false dawns before in the growth versus value debate. Um, so I think in the short term, I have no idea whether it's going to continue or not. In the medium term, three, four, five years, I think we're going to see a big, big uh, improvement in value in fact, in our newsletter next month, uh, we'll probably put in links to a couple of pieces, a couple of blog pieces on, on the subject, which I think cover it very, very well. And we tend to agree that, that at some point, um, you know, I, I get why people own the FANG stocks, but what tends to happen over time 
is that so much upside and blue sky gets priced in. Uh, it's almost like the boiling frog analogy where so much upside's priced into afterpay right now, but no one's really kind of noticed. And eventually something causes a reality check and people just go, oh, hey, hang on a minute. That, that, that now looks a bit risky, but, but this company over there trading on 10 times earnings, which is going to grow at 2 two or 3% per annum, now looks stunningly cheap. So um, at some point, the market will come to its senses. We hope it's sooner than, that sooner than later, but um, we're not sure. We're not sure. Um, uh, Tony's asked what drivers of reduction in discount to NTA do you anticipate in the future? Um, really good question, Tony. I think, um, look, the biggest issue for us, I think, is that there's going to be just less LICs around. So <clears throat> we saw a lot of we saw a lot of hot money come into the sector in IPOs. That's no longer happening. So there's no new IPOs. Therefore, there's no new LICs competing with the existing ones. In fact, the opposite's occurring. There's less and less choice. So you're now seeing money, the same amount of money, if you like, having less LICs to go around. That's going to keep putting pressure on those discounts. If we see a bit more stability in the market, that will continue. If we see uh, an improvement in the value versus growth dynamic, I think that will be good for LICs because there generally are more value managers in the LIC space. Um, and I think probably um, we're going to see also, and we've seen this a little bit already, some new players come into the market. So there are people like us who tend to put more money into the space when value emerges. But we're also aware of a couple of global, fairly large players from the States who are investing in Australia for the first time in a few years and buying LICs. Uh, we're seeing a few private investors, very wealthy investors put money into LICs for the first time in a few years. And we're seeing some existing kind of cross investment from the likes of Sand and Capital, from the WAM Group, from Global Value Fund, who all tend to hold LICs most of the time, but they've all substantially increased their activity in the sector, substantially increased their cross holdings over the last year or so. so I think all of that will help to continue to drive um, those discounts uh, a little bit tighter. Um, but uh, having said that, you know, the, the, the easy money's been made. So it's going to be probably a more gradual, um, gradual thing from here. Uh, I think that's just about it for the questions. Um, but as I said earlier, if you do have any questions, you are more than likely, more than welcome to give us a call or to email us at any given time. Um, but with that, I think we are um, almost out of time. So I'm going to call that a close for today. We will send out, hopefully tomorrow, uh, an email with a copy of the slides and a link to the presentation if you'd like to uh, review that or send it on to anybody. Um, and so all that remains is for me to say thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for dialing in. If you have any feedback one way or the other, I'd very much appreciate that. Uh, this is something we will do probably quarterly if there's demand for it. Um, and so if there are any things you particularly did or didn't enjoy and you want to see more or less of, please feel free to let us know so that we can incorporate that into any future. Uh, we've been asked. Thanks very much for your time and we'll talk to you again soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.